All right. Uh, what sound system did you follow as a youth? Well, I never followed a sound system, but I had a sound system that was domiciled in front of my house by the name of El Toro. And that sound like every Saturday night they play out, they would string up the set in the morning and taste the set and stuff like that. So I got to be hearing all the new songs. At the time, it was pre-release. It was like what I have now, a special. It was pre-release. So I got to listen, to hear songs before they actually became released on the radio. Yeah. So do you, do you believe Rocksteady was the greatest era in Jamaican music? That's an interesting question. Uh, it, 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 it was undoubtedly, undoubtedly the most creative part of the, our music industry to date. So, you know, I would tend to be in agreement with that statement based on the fact that I grew up in that time. And most of my work is really, I, 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 I tend to recall the cover that as the studio one song from the Rocksteady era. Because that's where I grew up and, and actually I know the value of those songs to date, you know. What was Augustus Pablo like in high school? Yes, but, but actually I, I was in front of Augustus Pablo, you know, so I never really spent much time with him in terms of at, at, at KC. But after leaving school, Gussie, who was one of my mentors, was recorded in Augustus Pablo, so I did, that, then I started to interact with him. And then when I, I lived in New York, he came and he stayed by my place a couple of times. And he, so, but at KC, there was much interaction because I was a, you know, a couple of years older than him. Did you have anybody around you dealing with Rastafari at the time? And why didn't you join the movement? There was never ever any inclination on me to, 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 to embrace Rastafari and faith, you know. But I respected the people who went in that direction. So, at the time, I would say I recorded Mighty Diamonds were Rastas. Uh, Robbie Shakespeare was one of my premier musicians at the time, Slide on Bar. So, there was interaction with Rastafarians, but I, I, I was never inclined to be a Rasta. Why did you leave Jamaica to move to New York? Well, my, I'm, I'm my only child for my mother, and at the time she, she had migrated to the States and then she sent for me afterwards. So I, at the time I really didn't have any choice. But that was in 1970. And in all those years, the longest I've ever stayed to Jamaica from 1970 is 11 months. It was the first 11 months I went to New York. After that, I've never been out of the country for any long period of time. Because, and I always knew I, wouldn't, I wasn't going to be staying in America for the rest of my life. I'm actually, actually I have no relatives here. Every, every, everyone is abroad except me. You know, I got a question. How were you able to get your record store going and how did you get into producing? Well, like, when I went to the States in September 1970, and you know, I'm here thinking that it's probably from 1971 I was in music. I, I was now here for a, for a year before I got that job. So I got a job in the record store, Keats Record Store, 1394 St. John's Place in Brooklyn. And uh, I, I worked in that store, and the, my the gentleman decided to retire and he asked if I wanted to buy the store. And I remember asking my mother for the money to buy the store. And her response to me was, I remember she sat in the bed and she said, Donovan, you think I could come to America, scrub white people floor, send you to school, and you talk about going into music? That was her response to me. And uh, at the time, I know all she saw was 
locks and ganja. That's what she saw. And she do want her one son to go in that direction. She wants to see her one son in jacket and tie and go work for the white man. That's what she wanted to see. Day. So I went back to Jerry, Jerry Stewart, and I told him what my mom said. And he said to me, okay, Donovan, what I'll do, I'll give you the store and you pay me $100 per week. And that is how I became an entrepreneur. And from there, I met the Lloyd Gussie, like I said, but my mentor. He started to give me songs to distribute for him in, in, in New York. Then Gussie's popular, then Lee Perry gave me stuff. Lloyd Campbell gave me stuff. I got a few stuff. So I learned the business from being a, a clerk in a store to being a distributor. And then, like I said, I used to come to Jamaica to buy records. So while I'm here buying records, I used to hang with Gussie. I mean, Gussie would go into the studio, or light camera, all this. Tag along into the studio and carry the tape. And, and I look at that my apprenticeship, you know, because I'm here learning the jargon and getting a feel of what it's like to be a producer. And, and I remember I went back up and I said to myself, I, I think I could, I could try a man at being a producer. And, and uh, I remember I came to Jamaica, and like I said, Lord Campbell was another one of my mentors. And he had this, this artist, Joy White, and he's Joy Ronnie Davis and the Itals. And the first song I did was, Sentimental reason with Joy White and um, went back to the States to the summer and then got good mild reception, but it was encouraging. And I remember I came back about 1978. I did this song, Don't Break a Promise by the Tamlins. And uh, I remember in the, on this tour in St. John's Place in the winter, and the phone rang about. about January, and it was this gentleman from Island Records in London who wanted to talk to me about this song. So, Lloyd Campbell, who basically he used to live in London, between London and Jamaica, I went up to London with him to meet with Island Records because they were interested in distributing the song. And it was also my first time in London too. London's a big market for the, for the music. So I figured I would go and meet the people that were involved in the music. I used to send records from New York, the Jet Star in London. So it was a time to go and, and meet them personally. And so at the same time, I, did, I made this deal with Island Records and made the, the, the you know, association with all the other folks in England. So, that is, all, that is all my foray into being a producer came about. Uh, you were able to have some very successful records uh, during that time. Um, can you tell us about your classic works with Cultural Roots? Oh, all right. Well, I, I met this, this, this man, I call him Gore. They give me a soul rest in peace. And, I used to, when I used to come to Jamaica, I used to record at Mixing Labs. I used to record at Dynamic Sounds. And we were by Tough Gang. I met him and he kept telling me about this group that is in Waterhouse. They didn't have any name, but he, he, he believed in them. And when I, and I decided to go, I went by his house. I remember Olympic Week, closer to Seawa Drive. And I met the lead singer for the group and went, decided to listen to him and decided to record him and gi I gave him a name because they were singing pure root song you know, and, you know at the time at the time roots was kind of like I, it was kind of popular you know and it's like a Sly and Robbie Anson Collins Radcliffe Bryant and and, and Ranchy McLean, the uh, musicians I used 
uh, along with cultural roots. So I just kept on recording, recording them. And at the time, at the time, they were the big sellers, you know. But it was the kind of music, the kind of music that I liked, you know. So I kept on recording them, and you know that. To this day, this is from 1978, and we're still talking about cultural roots now, in 2021, and the work, you know. But at the time, we, I have not seen these work as any work, great work. I just enthusiastic just recording, learning the craft, and things like that. But it turned out that those work are work that really has stood the test of time, you know because people really still appreciate those songs by Cultural Roots. When and why did you decide to come back to Jamaica? Well, it's a, it's a matter of evolving, you know, because I used to have to fly back and forth, back and forth to come to recording. And at the time, I was in, living in England at the time. I moved from New York and went to England because I lived in England for about three years. And I used to fly from London to Jamaica. So what I used to do, I used to rent the studio in advance for a month. Because at, at that time, they were doing really tough gang, dynamic sounds and... What's his name? That dynamic sounds and mixing lab came afterwards. At the time, it was tough gang and dynamic sounds. So there was that... You can't get in it through the time, you know. So you, you, you have to book it through the time, a month, six weeks in advance to get time. And make sure and say when you get your time out of your work, try to force everything into that. And I remember, one, I think in January or February, I booked a month at Dynamic Sounds. Flew in from Jamaica, made all the necessary arrangements with the artists, musicians to come and do my work. And I remember the Monday morning, I went down to Dynamic Sounds. And Byron Lee was inside there working. And <clears throat> they told me I couldn't get the studio time because Baron Lee was doing work for Carnival. So you can imagine me fly away from England to be told that I can't get the studio time. And, you know, and if I lose the studio time, and the next thing I push back at the people time because people have to book them time and pay them deposit everything like that. So I, I did, that, that was a... The catalyst in really me deciding to, at some point, get my own studio. But when I, I, I had moved back from, to, before that, I had moved back from England to Florida. And I opened a distribu my distribution in Florida. So I had back and forth. And when I had that issue with dynamic sounds, I decided that, you know, I'm going to a moon studio because the, the raw material is in Jamaica. They, 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 it does making sense to we'll fly back and forth, fly back and forth. But I'll I be in Jamaica, if anything, I'll fly, go do the business and come back and be where the raw material really is. So that's one of the reasons reason that pointed me in the direction of moving back to Jamaica. You know? And so I, 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 we had this song, Just Don't Wanna Be Lonely, with Freddie McGregor. And I decided whatever funds I, I, I got from that song, I was going to buy a board. So I bought the board and started off like a, it was like a one inch 16 track board. And started off paint out with that. And then I set up, started that, unfortunately, my mother died, I see, mother died. Spito started the, the, what is it, September, August, September, and my mother died December 8th. And she, she, she was her own child, she, she left it, some insurance money for me, and I just took the money and I was going to buy a 24 track machine, buy a two track machine, equipment, and it's really set up to how I really wanted it, you know. So that is how Pentos really started. And then I started doing my, doing my production and giving the stuff to Sonic Sounds to distribute. 
while I was doing my distribution in, 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 in Florida all at the same time. But then <laughs> I realized that at the time in the 90s, Penthouse would run the place, as you can imagine. And my royalty statement can go past $100,000 at the time. With all these songs that I have. And I decided, well, you know what? I will start this with my songs, my songs then in Jamaica myself. So we were at, at Slip Road, and the tape room, well, the 24 track tape room was about the size of this area, but there, so I decided to press the song. The first song I did was Murderer with Bojo. And <laughs> within, within the first couple of weeks, I realized Dojo told me that it was made and, and gone. So, so wait. It looked like, all the while I have focused on America, but there is business to be had in Jamaica, the same thing also. So I decided to make a domain distribution here in Jamaica. So I remember at the time now we used to press the dynamic sounds and the time because we did this move my things in from Shalik sounds. It it was kinda a way for go back that was really bit them press me at the time. So I press a dynamic sound and I press a tough gun. But when we realize now, it's like Easter, Independence, Christmas, we can't get a record press. Which is really the time where records really selling. But they are there also distributors. So they occupy the press themselves. So we just decide so well, my next step is set up my own pressing plant. You know, and decide so we'll set up a pressing plant. And Bujo said to me, said, Come, make me do the pressing plant together. And both of us set up the pressing plant and started doing the own manufacturing from the US. So. So that is where we went to the, that part in the distribution. Hey, when you, when you started uh, Penthouse, why did you uh, decide to go digital? Well, again, it's the advancement of technology, you know. So, in a bit of sense, if I look at the rule and see where this thing going as opposed to, I try to hold on to be called analog, I get hold on to analog. I want to tell you something, you know. To me, i much rather work in Pro Tools than in any analog world. Because when we, we in the industry, we sit and say, boy, it's so better with analog. But the consumer don't really care about that, you know. The consumer just care about it, if you love a song, you know. That's what they care about, you know. So you want a producer to try to make the song technically correct mix properly, that's how you do, do. because the, 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 the public, when you, when you do all those things, at the time, you press a record and you hear some shh, shh, from the record. So, in a sense, when you talk about you lose it in, 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 in pressing the record and things like that. And to me, the greatest thing is that I can now see the music as opposed to just hearing the music. We can just see the music and just take out, take out one word and correct it. I can, I can, I remember sometimes when, when we were analog, and we come and, and Dave Kelly and Tony Kelly mix a song, and I, and, I, and, I, and I came in the morning, and I listened to the song. I said, boy, you know, say, the higher tech could have looked a little louder, or the background could have looked a little bit louder. But if I go back and mix a song from scratch again, and it never going to sound the same as we hear it the day before. With this now Pro Tools, we just come back and say, recall, and everything back, I'm push up, put me push up and change, I'm gone, good to go, and I'm move on. But that is, what is the greatest, that is the greatest inconvenience. So I don't get stuck in analog this and analog that. I'm glad for Pro Tools, I should have it from day one. Because at the same time, at the same time, 
I can I can also keep up my my music in order and know exactly where to find things. If I can say that room inside, I'll show you that amount of 24 track tape inside. So if I go find something before Pro Tools came in, but dig down all them tapes and find a track. No, I, just, every, I transfer everything to Pro Tools. I'll press something and get it, whatever I want, and come up in a minute. What more I want? That is the convenience. And, then, and like I said, kids they must on their phone and listen, and that's why they listen to music. So we have to go analog and get caught up and say, boy, why we go digital? I should, have, I should be digital for my coming music business. I'll be happy here. And I'll have a bulk multi track tape I have inside here. So. Many, many, many careers have been birthed and revived at Penthouse, right? So, um, how did you get Buju, Tony Rebel, and Garnet Silk to join the Penthouse roster? All right. <clears throat> I, I used to have audition, and Tony Rebel came. This is Tony Rebel. Tony Rebel became a part of Penthouse. Wayne Wonder was the first artist that came to Penthouse. He was brought by, I don't remember who brought Wayne to Penthouse, but he was the first artist signed to Penthouse. And then Tony Rebel. And then Tony Rebel brought Garnet Silk. I remember when, when he brought Garnet Silk, Garnet was named Bimbo. And when I auditioned Garnet, he was not to scratch at the time and told him to go back and, you know, Put in some more words and thing. When he came, when, when he came back, he, he, the world saw what that what transpired. One of the things uh, that people you ask the question about how the, the, we have the artists from around us so long. You see that I just used that lab you see outside here, but the same concept at, at Sly Pro. I am a person, it, it's not just about putting the artists in the room and doing vocals. I'm about uplifting and teaching because my exposure in a first world country and I came back and saw what transpired in a third world country with you with them. So we talk about them, we talk about life and that thing like that. We talk about if you earn a dollar, what well, you must do with a dollar. So we have those kind of conversations. It was just about going to the studio. So we come and we every day and do every color song. But they come every day I was slow man, it, it, it became like a family. It became every single day. And so it wasn't like, say, a producer artist kind of relationship. It more transcended into a, a more family oriented situation where we just come have a good time, have a mix on tune, and each, and then again, a situation where each one, the next one, because Buja write a song, we need it, we write a song, we Buja might help us. So it, 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 it had that kind of family atmosphere, everybody came and helped each other. So I want to hear something say, I initially signed we and Buja and Tony Rebel. But after them contract expired, I never, I never really signed another contract with them. Because I just look at them and say, the relationship they really gone past a piece of paper signed by both of us. And my other thing say, if it, come, if it came to the point where you're happy with me, I do, hey, part company and make and move on. We don't come in and up in a court house in a body and worry about this because at the end of the day, I just lawyers ago, make it and it don't look good for the music. And we have seen many episodes of it don't look good for my music. So I just try and... I don't think so, we, not, we, not issue, we never have issues. We have issues, you know. But we try and minimize the issues, try and solve the problem, try and not be disrespectful. 
with each other. Because what's disrespectful, disrespect coming, me gone. You understand me? So that kind of, we never have that issue. So that, that's one of the reasons why you, you, you find that into this day, I'm recording Master Grace from 1984 till you come in here and sing the same way. Tony Rebbe from 1988 till now, Budget from 1991 till now, Barry Summer from 1989, same way. Have relationship. It wasn't about me being a producer. We just going and say, we're going to make some song. You understand me? We're going to make song. I want to make some good songs. Everybody put in them part and make sure they do them part. And develop, develop, develop the same kind of relationship with the musician them, be loyal to them. Because loyalty begets a certain level of professionalism where I tell people, I, I don't play an instrument, you know. I don't even know A, B, C, R, both footed music. But God give me this. If you sing it wrong, and if you play it great, I to know. So you find, sir, I have a core of musicians where they now leave with the studio until they are comfortable with their work, which is important in a, in a, in a music, in a situation like this. So nobody now really, it was not about a man come and, 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 and him come play and, and get pee for him play and gone. No. You see, some of them boys will come and he will record something and you see him, 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 him call him back and say to him, say, send track on him come hear something that he want to play. And he go and get pee everything and gone already. You know. But the level of respect and commitment we have to each other, him, him just call and say, send back the track to me. Let me correct something because I hear something. Technically, it does sound fine to me. But with him as the, as, as the professional, he says, no, something is not right here, so let me correct it. So, we develop a kind of relationship with the musicians, then we trust them. And the thing about it again as a musician, is when a musician comes into the studio, he must be wondering if he can get paid for his work. Because once a musician comes with that name, you can get the best of him. When he comes, he must just come play. And he gone through the door and he said, if he call back tomorrow, stop by tomorrow, he might get paid for him work. So you, you, you kind of take that e out of the equation and make it just be a creative environment where we are going to make music. And it's music we are make. So I was saying we just take out the, 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 the money to the equation and, and we, make, we just make, make it a creative environment where we just make music. You know, that's, that's how it really, really came about and, and lasted. I still really want to leave. Why do you think why do you think Barris did so well at Penthouse? Well, look at it this way now. There's really very few artists have the talent to Barris I'm having now. We can't deny that, you know. And uh, don't forget when Barris came to Penthouse, yeah, he, he had left because of a situation and was away for a while. And funny the 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 the, the oh Oh, I met Barris and started recording Barris. He came to Jamaica now and he went us around the place and he wanted some studio time. And I used to have the studio for myself Mondays, Thursdays and Sundays. And the studio rent out all the time. Because everybody wants to come to rent the studio now. And 
I just met, just in, in the conversation with him, and I said to him, "All right, Berries, I will give I will give you my give you money, but you have a singer song from one penthouse." And he said, "Okay." And the first song he did was "Tempted to Touch." So that was so "Tempted to Touch" became a hit. So automatically, there must be some level of continuation after that, and then. I had Butch at the time, Butch had in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the younger, younger years, very self, older audience. So when I used to work in the record shop, I remember they used to have the 12-inch and it was the, the vocal and the DJ at the end of the 12-inch. So that was from early, in the 70s. So I decided well, back in the 90s now to just bring back a situation where both into a combination, so Beres going to go in Bujo's audience, Bujo going to go in Beres' audience. And it, it worked and it continues to work. And it, was, it, was, it was a great visual also on stage. So it worked and you know, we just continue to do quality work because you know, two quality artists collaborating. So, so we did the same thing with, with, with Marsha Griffiths and Cotty Ranks. Marsha Gibbets and Tony Rebel. A, 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 a slew of songs around that time in, the, in, the, in, the, in that combination situation. Each person went into the next person's audience. What happened to the careers of Terry Gans and Cuddy Rinks? Seems as if they never really uh, met their full potential. You know, so, <laughs> you know, so I don't want to cut the wrong situation then. Because they, they talk about it and create a problem with me and him. Because sometimes your truth is met that not, not, not next year, next one truth. You know? What well, I can say about Terry Ganze is <laughs> uh, you know, so I can leave that part there. I can leave that, them two artists out of the equation. Sometimes I just let sleeping dogs lie. Hey, what, mis what musicians were you using in the studio in the 90s? Oh, like, like I said earlier, it was session musicians were Sly and Robbie, Ansel Collins, uh, Doogie Ratliff Brand, Ranchy McLean. Use that Thompson Sticky, West News, Willie Lindo, Dean Fraser, and Dean Fraser, who was about critical in whatever what I did, Dean Number and Chico. You want to read the, 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 the core of the musicians that I used at the time. The proudest moment. Me don't know about proud. I mean, I'm say, say the most satisfying moment in my career is, is, is when I could have give Buju Bantan a house for himself, based on where he must come in from. When, and, and I said, Tony Rebel get him house. And when I said, We don't want to get him house. And I said, Cut your ranks, get him house. Those were proud moments for me. You know? Tempting because it bear in a business that really don't care no pension, you know. And I also know that we grew up, we grew up with crackers and sardines and things like that, and you know. So I always one well, the critical thing for me as like a young man growing up is to have me own a house. Because more know say if rain falls, at least we can go inside. If light cut off, we can't get by candlelight. If water comes, we can go big with water and then, but we can't at least go in somewhere and 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 and, and really made. And at the same time, one of the things we may show you so with my discussion with the, all the artists there is a situation let them know say this business of winner, we must try and find a female in to involved in our lives as I was on the other half, who can contribute to the table. Because music is, is, is cyclical 
and uh, you find say you, you, you earn a money or so and you don't earn a money for the next six months. But the bills are the same way, you know. So you have to find a you have to find a woman who make the team work, you know. Where she can pay the light bill and the water bill and buy the crackers until you can get the next money for buy the probably steel, canal steel and whatever, whatever, whatever. But you make a teamwork. You, you can't find out, you can't want a woman with us because spend, spend, spend and profiling and everything. You have to find a woman who want to build with you. That's what you want as a, as a, as a anybody in the music. You want a woman who want to build with you, not a spender. Was there ever a competition between Bougie Banton and Terra Fabulous? Never. I don't even know where people get that from. Never, ever. Uh, and, and even the song you see, Pablo so Ada Yaka, Ada Yaka, Dan Pudong. When he come in him song, Buju took the song, demo the song, and gave it to people to learn the song away, and come back and record the song, how oh, oh, it was demoed for him. There was never, we, as much as we, 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 we try and, Melis say, leave the ego at the door. That's the first thing. Leave the ego at the door. But we come in, we come in as people who collectively want to make good music. So we do believe in a competition. I don't know where get that from. It's just that when, when Dave Kelly decided to go on his own, he carried fabulous with him and Bujo stay with, with, stay with, 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 with Penthouse. But there was never ever any, any, ever any of that around there. So I don't know, I don't know if people get, get, get that from. As an owner, right, a producer and manager, how did or do you uh, manage the egos of artists? Well, well let me say, <clears throat> When you look, or you look upon the things that me accomplish in a music business, and me just sing a slow side of the lobby, and put people's past me, me not the air, the open man go next to me, and the chain and the ray. So you see me kind of imprint by the people who come round me, you know. So the, you, you know, I said, you, the, you know, the ego business not gonna work. Cause me not exhibit no ego. Me just want to know, say, we're going to see you make, make a good sound. That's all I care about. What the, what the ego I get to? Take the ego inside, we have the ego inside going, but it, it can't work inside the because we, we have to be true to each other inside the you know. Because if you are seeing something and it's wrong, we have to tell you it's wrong. So if you have an ego problem, we can't say it's wrong. So one of one, 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 one the critical things in all of this in the bus, we always tell them, say, don't bring your woman to come to the studio. Because it takes on a different Take a, a big difference when you bring a woman because you, 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 want, to, you, you, bring, you want to impress a woman. So it, 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 that different kind of relationship is going to take place you now in terms of producer artists inside us. So. No bring a woman come. Look, and that's why Marsha Griffith said it best. She said, she doesn't she bring nobody connected to her to the studio. You know. Because she said, they've been, they don't have any work as NBC, they couldn't come and work with me. Which makes sense. Them couldn't go work with our NBC, our MCB or them, or them there. They would have to stay and she's going to work because she's still going to work to come. So I always have that. Nobody make you other half come with this. It changes the dynamics of the whole thing when we do that. How did you link up with Lanky? And how did you manage to keep that relationship so long? All right. Lanky came about when I was forming Till Shiloh, and I wanted a, a keyboard player. And I asked Danny Brown and Dean Fraser, we need, we need a keyboard player. And I said, Lenke, Lenke come. I think, I think Lenke was, was a what used to play for Dennis Brown's Light Parks. So Lenke came and the audition and him, we employed him. 
a time Link used to live in Dunkirk. You know, and I remember Link had come from struggling days in a boss. My man had the same shirt all two days in a row. And I remember one day Link had come and my first team said, What do you do with the rant? You know, if you need to get on him. Thing na, you know. And from this, so, I mean, develop that relationship. Because, I mean, let me say, if you're there around me, you have, to, you, have to represent, you have to represent yourself. You have to represent yourself. Yeah, so like you came when we were farming, still, still Shiloh Band. I asked Dean Fraser and Danny Brown here to find a keyboard player for me. So he sent Lenky. Yeah, Lenky is a play for Light Parks. And we auditioned Lenky and we employed Lenky. You know. So, like I said, Lenky was living in Braid Street and you can see poverty times, them times, struggling times, you know. Him come to the Lenky about the same shirt all two days in a row and, you know, you can see hard, hardship struggles are going on. And one day, I remember the team said, Yo, Lenky, I'm sure it just. And he never wanted to do the rant. And I never said to him, Yo, what's going on? You know, so can, let me say, I try to be upfront and straight with the people because I mean, this is my common man and, 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 and I go, a situation exists and not say a thing. Because I always know and, 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 and go forward. So, all the way, even to this day, like you remind about it, you know. If you, if you, if you come in and uh, you remind me that day, you don't want to stand for it, I say it to him. So, the, so the, the, a level of respect now developed because I can't you know, tell him something like that. So, it happened now, when we go up on the road, me and Lenke to go up on the road together. So we develop, develop a kind of relationship where if I go up on tour, it's me and him, everybody's gone somewhere. So we find, we used to find with Lenke you now, Lenke will go, in, Lenke go to Italy, go in on the, the, the most expensive tour, and put on the most expensive jacket, you know, and come out and say, well, at least I try it, at least I know the expensive jacket feel. <laughs> So the Lenky became the, the, the MD for Bojoban and also he became one of the critical components of Penthouse Sound in the sense that when we read Lenky for Lenky, I, I think if you check it, Lenky had the most keyboards of any musician right now in Jamaica. I can say that without a doubt. He had the most keyboards any keyboard player in Jamaica. Right? Every time he goes home, he's coming back. Every tour, he's coming back with one or two keyboards. And I'm on a tour all these years. Lenky has about 30 keyboards set up downstairs in the basement right now. Uh, 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 There's a song here, uh, a song, no, a song I didn't hear that song, a song before. It's a song he go back from 1919. I see my beautiful like son, can nobody know family have that son is going on again. He just go back and play it and that song it sounds so different. You know? I'm so many develop a, a relationship where, you know, to this day exists, you know. So let me say anybody will come around with me, try and 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 and, and have a relationship. You have, you have a, a young lady named Sherita. No. Or you want me to meet her now? Do you seem to bring her come, come to put the background vocals for that song for me? So she put her on the background vocals, she sings, 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 sing, and me has, and me has said something to her, she has said to me, like, so well, then, and so she got to me. And that's what I mean, I appear some of my thing, though. You understand me? So from this, so, I'm a bestie. <laughs> See, all right, so, I come, come, boom, 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 rush me interview. My dog will make up a nice outside, eh? but she, she's like my, my little sister. Where we have a, again, like I said, it's not really beautiful, a relationship, but critical it is, relationship. Where it transcends music. Anybody is around me, 
It's not about the music. It's about music and a relationship. Hey, Dave Kelly's a, like a super producer, right? I don't hear a lot about him when people speak about music. But why, why do you think he doesn't get the credit he deserves? All right. I think Dave Kelly, he means a recluse, you know. And uh, I, think, I think that there was, there was, a, there was a time where the tax department was giving me an name. Hell. Every minute, I did it and this and courthouse, and I think he got fed up and just migrated. So, talented, that talented as he is, you have to be here in Jamaica to get the accolades it mushroom out into the world. But I can tell you one thing, he was one of the most talented engineers of the place. Great song writer. Him have, him have, him have, him, him, him beats them, wicked. He might not be a great, great musician, but he have some beats that make you keep you dancing. You understand me? But, you know, but I, I think Dave is comfortable with how his life is, because him, that's how he wanted it. You know, that's how he wanted it. You've been doing this for a very long time. You, it's obviously you still have eye for talent, right? Um, what characteristics do you look for in an artist? And why did you sign Romaine Virgo and Dalton Harris? Like, what did you see in them that you say, you know what, they have potential and we could work with something? When people have talent, you know, you know, for it, it no high, you know. You know, the people have talent. But, but what me look for, is the, is the temperament and attitude of God the talent. Because I'm, 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 a, I'm a very spiritual person. This is my spirit not take you. You could have the most talent. I can't work with you. you know, because you just can't work with me. You know, it's, it's not so, I, and it, I'm sorry, you, you, you can't say a lot of talent, a lot of, you know a lot of talented artists, what you know, because of them behavior when they were successful, you know. And, and they make them behavior, behavior there from early to, you know. So just that sometimes some man, people want to look past the behavior because they want to record the artists. Me nobody look past that, you know. Me, if I see that red flag, it's all right. Me talk with you and everything, but I miss it from me ever since. Me, me come to the music business. I don't have to record the number one artist. I don't have to. Because one, one time I'm going to see them record, so I enjoy what I do. I want to create something, we have a good time recording it. Because I swear it's going to sound good. So, Romaine, as you can see, Romaine's temperament is, it is, you know, like, it's just, it's just conducive to him being successful. Dalton, Dalton have him issues and things. Talented, but him have him issues. Him have find him way. Hopefully him find him way. But you can't deny him talent. You know, you can't deny him talent. And him love him, him still. Well, let me hear you say my